Um, good morning. It's uh, Wednesday morning. It's coffee with the commissioner for the month of May. And we had a few technical problems. Maybe it's the rain. We'll, we'll blame it on the rain and the gas shortage. That's what we'll call it. And definitely not the Russian hackers, although they could be to blame as well. Um, we're very, very happy to have Janice Gilly, Eric Gilmore, and special guest, Dr. Deanna Oleski. She is our chief medical examiner for the first judicial circuit. And we had her just a couple of months back, but um, there's been some interesting and really um, concerning news coming out of her office uh, that she shared with the Board of County Commissioners. And so I really uh, look forward to discussing that with her and, and some of the issues that, uh, that she brought forward because it's, it's alarming and it's stuff that people need to, need to know about. So look forward to that discussion. But um, before we get there, we've got a couple of county updates that we want to get to. And so I always like to turn it over to Janice Gilly, our county administrator, so she can give us some updates. Janice, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for having us again. So uh, I want to start with a little bit of good news, which it does appear um, that the bridge is still in progress. We get our weekly updates from FDOT, and it does appear that the, the bridge is um, still progressing um, as they had hoped. So we're we're thankful to, to try and um, get that back up and going for the citizens that work in Escambia, but also work or live in um, Santa Rosa as well. And uh, in that news, there's also, we're going to start the ferry service this week. And oh, um, yeah. And so, you know, as you know, the ferry is an opportunity for folks to try and try and uh, go from the beach to the mainland. Um, it's a, it's a, maybe a little bit, um, slower than some of the other uh, ferries that you might have ridden uh, in shorter commutes around the country. However, it is a very viable option. Um, there will be one schedule this week, and then they will continue to modify that schedule based on the needs of our residents and visitors um, as they come and go. It is a passenger ferry, which means it is not an automobile ferry but it still does provide another alternative. And should anything happen with the bridge, it's an alternative that'll be up and going, uh, hopefully throughout the whole summer, and it would be a reliable alternative. Um, the other thing that's going on is, you know, with the fuel situation, um, the governor created a state of emergency yesterday. Uh, we were, Eric and my, well, myself and many others were on a call that um, CISA and the federal government hosted to just give us some information about Kind of what happened and what our IT departments and folks can be looking for uh, to kind of continue to harden ourselves and protect ourselves from that as well. Um, as you know, the EPA uh, sent out a letter, you know, trying to make sure there were a lot of fuel waivers, um, you know, to make sure that there aren't any disruptions um, in the system. On Monday, when we met with the directors, when I met with our directors at the county, um, I mentioned to Eric and to West Marino that we wanted to make sure that we were full uh, so that we would not have any gaps in public safety or public works. Um, and the good news is West Marino was able to go on and secure a delivery on Tuesday. While we already had 21 to 25 days worth of fuel, we just weren't sure exactly on Monday morning how this was going to go. And we were able to get that delivery and we are quite secure for a month. Um, so, the, uh, so that left us having to worry about how our employees would get to and from work and be able to provide those services. But I think we're looking good now. Um, I would just like to give a shout out to Senator Broxson. I talked to him on Monday as well, and he talked to me about the, the uh, Transmontane uh, terminal having the winter mix and trying yes. to get the waiver for that. So he was already on that on Monday, and uh, I just appreciate you know the way he was looking out for our community in that regard. And so as you know, we have gotten that waiver to utilize the Transmontane uh, fuel is my understanding. Yes. So, so I think that I think in some, in some regards, a major crisis may have been averted. Obviously, Eric can speak to whether or not that's too soon to say that, um, because I know that he is getting regular updates from the state, and um, they've just been fantastic to provide that information to him every couple of hours, and uh, I just appreciate that. The other thing Eric, that Eric... You, oh, can I ask Eric real quick? Eric, um, do, you, have you, do you have any insight? Is the fuel, are the fuel trucks moving this morning, and do you know if the gas stations are going to be replenished? So uh, driving in this morning, majority of the stations had fuel and there were okay. one or two trucks or vehicles in line. Uh, there, there wasn't as big as a line has been. I do believe the fuel supplies overnight, they, uh, they have gotten better. Uh, the, they, they're pulling from local stock now, so they're not having to go as far to turn and burn. So it's, uh, they're replenishing pretty quick. So I think we're stable. We're stable. As, as I looked this morning, I looked on Gas Buddy, 
Most gas stations have fuel. There's very few out there that don't. So uh, we look like we're, we're good. Good. I'm sorry, Janice, back to you then. Oh yeah, no, no. The only thing I was going to mention was that um, one of the first waivers that I think that um, Highway Safety Motor Vehicles, the governor and the federal government looked at were those waivers related to how long a driver can drive. Um, as you know, we have what I call a, na a national manpower shortage. Um, mm. And that shortage is for what I think are uh, essential occupations in our country. And for us at the county, that's everything from corrections to EMS to fire to animal welfare. Um, we have major gaps in uh, you know, manpower. And so uh, if I understand correctly, we were already in an issue in, a con in this country with hazmat um, eligible drivers, drivers that have the quite the right qualifications to continue to deliver those, you know, that fuel. And um, so that was already an issue. And so one of the first waivers that they did was allow those that are currently providing those services to drive a little bit longer. Um, you know, makes you a little nervous. But on yeah. the other hand, um, if they're driving at night and there's fewer people on the road, it, it may be a situation that, you know, like an emergency situation that you have to handle. Um, the other thing I would just mention is Eric's going to talk to you in a little bit about, you know, we're trying to do a campaign where we say know when to call 911. Um, he can yes. share some of the examples with you and our citizenry um, as to why you need to really think about calling um, and if he doesn't share one of the most, most egregious ones I've heard of, I'll share it. <laughs> um, but people un unfortunately do kind of abuse 911 and we're just mm -hmm. not able to respond to those kind of abuses. Um, and so anyway, I'll let him talk to you about that. The other thing that we have on the horizon is we have a city county meeting on Monday, yes. uh, May 17th. And yep. some of the issues that we're going to talk about is the library MSTU. As you know, libraries are very a very important public service to our community, and we are partners with the city um, as we kind of took over uh, the library system from the city or with in partnership with the city at, several years ago. It's time for them to renew their MSTU, and we need them to do that. So we're going to have that conversation with them. Uh, the other thing that we plan to talk about is uh, homelessness. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, it is a great issue. Yes. I think the city has some ideas that they want to share with us. Um, and then the other thing, two other issues. Uh, so the Pensacola Shipyard is available for sale and it is a very large uh, price tag. We all understand that. And it is on the uh, west uh, eastern side of Bio Chico. However, which is in the city. However, um, working waterfronts, you know, are a serious issue in the state of Florida and the opportunity to potentially uh, partner with the city and maybe uh, pursue waterfront grants to just enhance that entire area and revitalize it um, is something that I think the staff would like to talk about. And uh, we'll also talk about the American Creosote property. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to uh -huh. be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Good news is you don't have to vote at the meeting, <laughs> but it'll be an opportunity for conversation. Interesting. So go, going back to the Pensacola Shipyard, that's a private company, right? I mean, that's a private company that operates out of that mm -hmm. location. It is. And then you also have the um, auto shred or it used to be called auto shred. You know, you have that property, the salvage property. Um, there are like five or six properties, maybe seven properties along there um, mm -hmm. that provide an opportunity uh, for revitalization and, and also a, um, you know, a safe harbor in terms of uh, a marina that would be up in a bayou. So, so there's, you know, it's one of those probably dreams in terms of, um, you know, of, of what could be, but I do think it, it, it's worth a conversation because I do think that places like Bio Chico are not everywhere along the coast. Um, and it's just, it would be very interesting to look and see what the possibilities would be for our community. Do we know what the price tag is on that, Janice? I do. I can't remember it. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Um, well, I'm million. sure we'll hear about it Monday. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It's on, it's on the, um, I, it's, it's millions. It's hey, Janice, before we before we swing it over to Eric, um, I had you have a question from an online uh, uh, viewer um, with the demands of the job of public information officer and it being 24 seven. That's the nature of it. Will, will you be discussing with the new fire chief? Because we do get Eric's going to talk about our new fire chief. Will you discuss with the new fire chief and the public safety director hiring a separate public information officer for public safety? Is that something you would ever entertain? 
Yeah, we've Are already we've it? actually already posted it, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay. I know we've Good. posted. So what we've posted is a public safety PIO. Um, our current PIO, Laura, actually, that's her background. She came, she came oh, really? from different public safety posts. Um, and so she's looking forward to working with someone that Eric and them, uh, you know, post out there at public safety, but they will be under her direction. And then um, we're also actually looking to work with the library and make sure that we also monitor and manage that, pub that um, PIO as well. Um, I okay. think a uniform way of managing public information and then also making sure that we're very strategic and so that each piece of public information gets the proper recognition is kind of what we're wanting to do because I think previously we had so much good information to share we were sharing it kind of on top of each other so it right. might not have all been getting out you know so we kind of need to make sure that it gets out throughout the day in a way where it gets recognized because so we really that have a lot of good news. Oh yeah, absolutely. And Eric's been sending out the, the weekly report and, and buried in that report every week are nuggets. I mean, nuggets of great news that unfortunately are not making it to the, to the newspaper or the, or the uh, WEAR. Unfortunately, the, the negative stuff comes out. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fantastic. Um, Janice, what else do you got for us? I think we're good right now. Um, I, the only okay. thing I would say is that I, I think we were down to 28 hospitalizations with yes. COVID. And so I think I'm just, you know, praying that we're turning the corner in that regard. Um, you know, so let's just hope. I, I, uh, I, unfortunately, I think that Dr. Oleski is gonna mention um, what I call the residual effects of COVID. We're now yes. starting to see those. So, so the, the disease was the tip of the spear, but now mm -hmm. we're starting to see what comes behind that. And I really yes. hope that folks pay attention to what she has to say and that they also monitor um, their family and their, yes. you know, employer, their, their co-employees and things like that. Um, so I think what she has to say is going to be exceedingly important um, as we continue to move past the disease, but into, like I said, those residual impacts. Absolutely. And, and on the subject of COVID, this is from our um, uh, Scammy County dashboard, which I encourage folks to go to. It's got, tr it's a, tremend a tremendous wealth of information, www.myascambia.com. And then right there on on the top, you'll see a link to the dashboard. But as of right now, according to the dashboard, we've tested 189,409 uh, individuals. We have 36,000 cumulative cases, 36,230. Sadly, we've ha we have had 770 deaths attributed to COVID-19 in Escambia County. Um, but we have had 100,675 100, citizens vaccinated, which you know, about, about a third or so of our population, um, maybe a little less than that. And then as Janice mentioned, we have 28 hospitalized. Uh, about three months back, we had nearly 300. We had 291. So we've definitely turned the corner. But the thing I've noticed about the hospitalization number is it went down to 20, and then it went up above 30, and now it's at 28. It's just like it's not going away. You know what I mean? It, we just can't get it to go away, but we're doing a lot better than we were before. Um, Eric, I want to throw it down to you now. We've got a brand new fire chief. Uh, that's great news. Tell us a little bit about him and, and when he's coming aboard. So we have uh, Chief Jason Catrambone. He's out say, of wait, say his last name again. Is it like Rambo? Catrambone. Catrambone. Yes. Okay. Jason Catrambone. So uh, he's out of North Dakota. Uh, 25 years of experience, 18 years as a uh, executive officer or a battalion chief for hire. Uh, comes with a wealth of knowledge. His, he's built fire departments in the military with DOD uh, over in uh, Kuwait, those areas, and came back over here. Uh, stood up fire departments in the oil field industry and then has taken over the city of Wilson and up in North Dakota. So wow. he's got experience building fire departments, uh, putting things together, uh, putting them in, you know, building, the, building them in and getting the training and everything. So I'm looking forward to it. He's going to bring, uh, he, he shares the same mission, vision values that we do uh, as far as, you know, accountability, getting things done right and, uh, and doing the job for the citizens. So I'm looking forward to having him come on board and uh, seeing where he's going to take us. And uh, tagging on to that, we also don't, we do we or do we not have a brand new EMS director coming aboard? We do as well. So uh, we do have our EMS manager, uh, Jason, uh, no, not Jason, uh, David Forsell. Uh, he'll okay. be here June. So David starts June 1st uh, for EMS uh, manager uh, position. And then Jason starts uh, June 14th. So both of them will start in June. Uh, so you, I'll be bringing them down to you guys to meet and uh, have a discussion with the commissioners and uh, introducing them to you and then uh, let you see what they're about. And I'm excited about what these guys are going to bring to the table and how they're going to take us and, and get us moving forward. So, well, I, I just want to say, Eric, uh, since you've since you've taken over the extra duty because you're the emergency manager, but now you're wearing two hats and, and you're doing the public safety direct. 
director job. Uh, I just think you've done a great job and I'll just throw a shameless plug for you for the position on a permanent basis if you'd be willing to do it. I know it's probably uh, a mm -hmm. very interesting job. Uh, I know that both of your jobs are, but I, I, I just think you have the disposition to do it. So I certainly hope Janice would, uh, would consider it for it because I think you'd hell of a job. Well, we have to convince right. him to take it. <laughs> you got to take it, man. We need you. Come on. We need you to step up. <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I want to mention something that Eric is doing. So Eric is communicating exceedingly well with all of his departments. Um, and he, he communicates with them weekly. Um, obviously he talks to anyone daily. That's, that's not a problem for him. He has, he's always had a very wide open door. Um, but I would say that the communication that he has provided at public safety has been exceedingly well received. Um, and even though he doesn't always have the best news, he always has news. And I yeah. think that's what the folks have been starving for is some kind of information uh, from him. And I know that he has been joined by the potent, the new fire chief on some of his calls with the, with the staff. And I think that has been well received as well. And so, you know, we just, we just pray now for more bodies, more people to come yes. and EMTs, paramedics, firemen, um, and join the team uh, because I definitely think it's on a very positive trajectory under Eric's leadership. And and I and I agree with that 100. And I will say one of the one of the things that you're seeing nationally around uh, the country, and I think you'll it won't be long till you see it here in the state of Florida, is these governors are saying enough, enough is enough yes. federal money. We don't want it anymore. You're destroying our economies. You're destroying businesses because no work when you're dumping all this money in their lap. And oh by the way inflation is happening. I mean, look at the cost, but look at, look at gas. It's up a dollar a gallon since the new administration, not to get too political, but the, the realities are the realities and the wage push inflation, you can't deny it, you know? And, and, you know, and, and so, as I say, as that trickles down to us, I think if we remove some of these, I mean, there's a laundry list of um, acronyms for all these different federal programs that you can get this money, if this, for this, for this spouse here. And, and Alabama just said, no, we don't want it. Texas is moving that direction. And I don't believe it'll be for, before Florida does, because sometimes a good thing, too much of a good thing turns into a bad thing. And I think that's what we're seeing here, but, but back on the subject, today's news journal this morning, as I read it before I came in, um, has a, a pretty stark uh, article there, Eric, and you're prominently featured in it about EMTs and paramedics. So um, what's the plan to get that fully staffed? Um, you know, I get a lot of calls on it and I understand we get a lot of frivolous calls. You know, grandma has a headache, send, send an ambulance. You can't do it. We don't have the manpower, but What's our plan going forward? So going forward, uh, we're going to first and foremost hit a campaign that's uh, as to educate the public on when to call 911. What are, you know, when do you need to call 911? So we just had a situation last night where a, a lady in a nursing home just didn't want to be there. So we sent an ambulance to go evaluate her. She had no medical emergency or anything, but our crews transported her, but just because she didn't want to be there. So these are things that we've got to stop doing. The, the we had the old saying, you call, we haul. Well, we're not mm -hmm. at that point anymore. We can't, you call, you call, we haul. We got to evaluate, assess, and make sure you meet certain criteria to put our resources toward you. So um, we've had people call to charge your cell phones. We've had people to call to turn the TV off. We've what? had people call, yes. And they, they were sitting there ready to go, to go to the hospital. They get to the hospital, they refuse uh, against medical advice. And then they walk across the road to the mall. We, we have people who call for two things. We have people who call, they fell four days ago and now they want to go to the hospital. I, you know, these are things that people could take a ride in a car to their primary care physician or to an right. urgent care and get those things handled, but they call us. They always call 911. So um, we're trying, we're, we're working on upstaffing. I'm, I'm bringing a plan to you guys, uh, the, to the board uh, later this month for a fee schedule increase so we can increase our fees. Uh, we haven't increased our rates since 2011. We've had an increase in equipment, increase in manpower, insurance, uh, apparatus, gas. gas. So yeah. uh, we're asking for that. And in turn, we're hoping we can throw a little bit back to the employee to be competitive with lifeguard and AMR. Yes. We really want to build and retain that core good group. If I could get a stack of applications and I go through and be very selective and get the best of the best, that's what we want to do and retain those people and have the good leadership and the good people here working for us. And then we want to absolutely put more people on the road and more trucks on the road. Um, we try to put 15 on the road during the day and at mm -hmm. least eight or nine at night. And I would like to put, double, put 20 on the road today and put 15 on at night. 
Uh, so we're wanting to put more trucks and more people on the road. And I know we're working toward uh, with our bargaining with our, of course, you know, I'm, I'm not at liberty to discuss specifics, but we're working toward some solutions on our end from a policy perspective in terms of wages and, and potential mm -hmm. things uh, that we can do to, to make your job of recruiting easier. But one thing I want to say, transitioning over here from the school board, we had a um, we had a program over at West Florida Tech, and I know we've voted on a um, uh, on an MOU with the school board recently. They have a program, and I think it's an EMT program. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is there any way we can we can um, make that group when they graduate high school with their diploma? create a bridge at the county to get them certified or is, or is there just no way to do that or when they come out of uh, high school with their whatever their completion certificate in that career field are they able to come and work for us because I think you give a high schooler you know um, if we if give, we give them the right pitch it's a good job I mean it's good money mm -hmm. benefits I mean they start at 18 years old you know you can be retired at 48 that's I mean it's hard for a kid to see that but sitting here at 53, I wish someone would have punched me in the face and told me that when I was 18, right? I mean, <laughs> I'd be uh, I'd be on the beach with a with pina colada with the, uh, like Thurston Howe with an umbrella in it, right? Instead of getting up. Right. But can we do that? Can we bridge the high school to us? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. And <clears throat> for whatever reason, it ceased to exist a couple of years back. I don't, we did have that program where we were tied in with the students and educating them. Uh, we're trying to get that back. That's what you guys approved for me right. this last board meeting was so that we can have their students right along with our people yes. and, and see what we do. And that's the recruiting piece. That's how we get them tied in. And once they finish the program, we get them uh, certified and then they're with us. Uh, so, no, we, we are bridging that gap to make sure we can tap into that resource. Not only that, you know, PSC, uh, did, uh, George Stone, which is where the EMT paramedic program is, or the EMT right. program is, and they're trying to start a paramedic program as well. So we're going to tap into that. I've got fire trying to tap into it to try to, cause they've yes. got a fire program and yes. we just hired some, uh, cadets. So the cadets, uh, they finished their program up later this month and we were hiring these guys. They'll be already onboarded. And guess what? In a couple of weeks, they'll take their state exam and they'll be, you know, fire one or fire two certified firefighters. We just roll them from a cadet to a firefighter. Now they're on the truck fighting fire. So I, love it. I don't know why these things had stopped, but we are going back and bridging those gaps, tapping into that talent pool and getting it on board at a whole lot quicker. And that way we have a stream of people trying, we're trying to funnel into our programs. Yes. Well, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, cause it, it needs to happen and, you know, um, I know you got a, a tough job ahead of you. Um, I just want to thank you, Commissioner Bergosh, because you and the board have been very, very supportive um, of our EMTs and paramedics. And yes, so yes. Even though we didn't have a wage opener discussion scheduled until next year. You all have given us the authority to have a wage opener conversation with them tomorrow. And so that is huge. Um, and it's us. It's management going to them. They didn't come to us. And I think that's the way um, that whenever you have a good collective bargaining arrangement, it should work out. You know, we yes. hammered out our negotiations with IAUP in, I believe, two meetings. Um, I think the third meeting was just to clarify everything. And we were done, you know, within two or three months of the expiration of the previous CBA. And so because of, I think, that relationship that we have with that particular union, um, we're able to now go back as management ask them for a wage reopener, which is very unique where management asks for the wage reopener. Mm -hmm. But thanks to you and the other board members, we're going to do that tomorrow for our EMTs and paramedics. And no, we did it's, it's, last week with PBA. Um, we haven't finished that one, but I just wanted to say thank you publicly because no, that no. is a bit uh, different than the typical union relationships. Well, it's not easy for us. I mean, it's going to cost us money, but at, at the end of the day, again, I, I believe this is another ancillary impact of reckless runaway federal spending. I'll just say that because that's what it is. When you're printing trillions of dollars, incentivizing folks to stay at home and not go to work, jobs report came out the other day, it was a, a third of what they thought it would be. And people are trying to say, well, this is a good thing because it's ridiculous. You've incentivized people to stay home. It's impacting the, the business community. McDonald's has to pay 15 bucks an hour now. What does that mean? And we can't get firefighters or EMTs. What does that mean? So. It's a big problem. And I know uh, as we transition and segue down to Dr. Oleski, I know she has her own uh, staffing challenges as well. Um, and Dr. Oleski, thank you for your patience. There was just a lot going on. But um, when you sent that email to me, that was compelling. 
And the last sentence of your email, when you talked about, um, well, first, the, the context of this, tell us, tell us about that percentage increase in, in, in drug overdoses. What, what prompted that, that, that email that you sent us? So every year, Florida um, Medical Examiner's Commission, and actually twice a year, they put out a, a drug report. Um, this information is actually really good information because it actually gives us, uh, able to give us our counties in live time of what's actually happening versus when things go to vitals or the state, there can be a two year delay. So we're able to give you guys something uh, like a feedback of what's going actually on, you know, boots on the ground of what's happening. Um, the, I have seen personally, anecdotally, of what's been going on with drug overdoses in um, District 1, which is the four counties, Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton. From my perspective of from being in St. Augustine versus here, I've noticed that there is a markedly increase in drug overdoses compared to my workload in St. Augustine. I think mm -hmm. it's multifactorial as to why that is, but um, in Escambia County alone, we saw a increase of uh, 63 percent in drug related deaths from 2020 to 2019 just in Escambia wow. County wow. that's an extra wow. 70 people say, say that again what was that increase just in Escambia County 63 percent is an extra 73 people year over year now year do you attribute year. that do you attribute that to COVID-19 or any of that to COVID-19 and everyone just being locked down with nothing to do I think a large part of it can be due to COVID-19 and their access to resources of having mm -hmm. clinics shut down. They're not able to go to therapy. They're not able to go to their Suboxone clinics because things were shut down. I think mm -hmm. that's part of it. I think another part of it is of what is currently in the drugs. So we've always had historically a large methamphetamine problem. Uh, and now the methamphetamine is contaminated with fentanyl. So we're having per usual methamphetamine users uh, thinking that their drug is safe, which obviously no illegal drug is safe, but now their methamphetamine is unexpectedly contaminated with fentanyl. So they're not normally opioid abusers, but they're dying of opioid related deaths. Let me, let me ask you, I, I, you know, and I, I, I apologize for my naivete, but I, I just don't know a lot about this drug, these drugs and stuff. Um, so methamphetamines, isn't that like a stimulant, like an upper, get you going? So what, yep. why in the world would the drug pushers be cutting it with fentanyl to make them, is it to make them consume more? I mean, what, what do you think the rationale is? Because it seems like you're mixing two things that take you the opposite direction. I, I personally don't know, um, but I think part of it is it's is fentanyl is actually much less expensive, I think, than methamphetamine is. Um, oh. It's just, you don't need a lot in the, you don't need a lot in order to get that kind of high. And then you create a new kind of addict. Yeah, because not only are they addicted to meth, they're, they're now an opioid addict, which is yes. difficult. Let me ask you, so where are these people getting the fentanyl? I mean, obviously you're saying it's, it's relatively inexpensive. Is it being shipped in or are people uh, sophisticated enough to manufacture it now like they do the methamphetamines? So um, that's actually a really good question. The methamphetamines is, is probably more homegrown than anything else. The fentanyl mm -hmm. is, it, you do need to have a rather sophisticated industrial uh, complex in order to manufacture fentanyl. It's not as easy of a chemical reaction or synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, as for where is it coming from here? I'm thinking it's probably coming from Texas on the I-10 corridor, um, wow. but for my in St. Augustine, it was coming up from Miami. So I'm thinking yeah. it's the only logical sense for me. Well, and, and you pointed out in the report that this is the first year ever that fentanyl over outpaced like alcohol and these other drugs as the number one. Is that is that correct, that statement? That is correct. And actually that's probably the most shocking thing to me. So. With COVID, as we all learned that our alcohol consumption has gone up as a society. So I was very shocked to see that fentanyl for the first time ever has surpassed alcohol in terms of wow. being in a, in a detected in a decedent. Uh, that means that, you know, those who are driving or may not be driving drunk anymore, but they may be still driving under the influence. Well, one, one of the things that you've uh, recommended is 
you know, the big push about a decade back or maybe a little further was to get these AEDs, maybe a couple decades now, the AEDs, because they save life, lives, the defibrillators, and you're having a heart attack, boom, you pull one off the wall and you can shock someone and you can save their life. But um, you were saying that we need to have Narcan side by side. Is that something that you would, uh, you would agree with? Absolutely, 100%. I worked with um, the EMS director in uh, St. John's County about this, and I actually almost teased him of how much and how many people that they would Narcan. So wow. they would keep track of their saves, and it was including the St. John's County deputies. They would have it on them, and they were encouraged to use them. So they would get monthly reports of how many people they saved, um, including the deputies, which encouraged them to use them to use an Narcan. And honestly, it feels good when you save a life, you know. And yes. the, that is an instantaneous like turns it around. Yeah. Usually, <laughs> and you have to be you have to watch out because you might get socked in the face when you take <laughs> somebody back. Yeah, because you, you're taking I'm their buzz, about. you're you're stealing their buzz. I've seen that on the TV shows, but so Narcan. Okay, well, I, I'd be I'd be remiss if I did not put a plug out right now. Narcan is available in Escambi County for free. If you have a loved one who perhaps struggles with addiction, or you are around people that you believe might you know overdose, you can get it for free, you and it can. doesn't hurt anybody. And it you doesn't hurt yet. Yeah. Listen to the doctor. It doesn't hurt. You can't hurt them, right? It, but it will save a life. If someone is overdosing on an opioid, this, what does this do to their body, doc? What, how does it bring them back? Um, it, it interacts with the receptors in your brain uh, to compete with the fentanyl that's currently in your system. So it can be kind of temporary, but it does bring them back. Um, wow. But depending on how long the opioid is in your system, you might have to repeat that. But for the most part, it, 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 it blocks those receptors so that you can start going again. It's, it's well, really, it's important. It's life-saving. It's intranasal. That means you just take it and you yes. spray it in their nose. Um, really easy to use. You cannot hurt them. And yes. I personally, I think that everybody who's unresponsive should be Narcan. By yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, I, I want to point out where people can get it. Um, number one, you just mentioned the Narcan. Uh, you, you spray it. It's like a nasal spray. If someone's convulsing or they're, or they're going unconscious, you spray it in there and, and that brings them back. But in Pensacola, Florida, Escambia County, you can get Narcan for free. Call 479-4456, the Health and Hope Clinic. Um, this is a generous community. Impact 100 Pensacola Bay, uh, a group of uh, phil philanthropic uh, female uh, people, they put a lot of money, are you, and Dr. Olesky is a member, my wife is a member, many people, I, I believe Janice Gilly is a member as well. Um, they each put $1,000 in and they award these grants. Well, a year and a half ago, they awarded a grant to one of our faith-based community clinics, the Health and Hope Clinic. If you call the Health and Hope Clinic on Olive Road, on the Olive Church campus, they will give you Narcan for free, free. They distribute it because of this grant. So nobody should go without having Narcan. And I think... Um, Dr. Oleski, thank you for, for pointing that out and advocating for that. But people sometimes don't know how to get it. One of the reasons Health and Hope Clinic, ha Clinic has it is because the closest place to get it for free was Walton County before Health and Hope Clinic got it. So take advantage of that resource, Health and Hope Clinic online, 479-4456, get the Narcan, and you can save a life. So um, to me, that's, that's pretty profound. Eric, I assume we have Narcan in every single uh, ambulance that's run in the streets. We do, and uh, we have been administering it uh, a lot here lately. And it's interesting that you say that because that was one of the things when I talked to Jim Little with the news journal yesterday, we are seeing an absorbent amount of overdoses. So yeah. since since the first of this year through April the, let's see here, what was it, April 28th? No, April the 25th, we gave 338 doses of Narcan. Whoa, whoa say that again? From... The first of this year uh -huh. through April the 25th, I'm sorry, April, April the 8th. Uh, that was the last report I had. I got to update my numbers from, from the first of this year to April the 8th, we gave 338 doses of Narcan. Yeah, that's we, only three months. Yes. That's, that, that's, a, that's, in, that's incredible. Do we know how many of those resulted in a save by chance? That would be a great number to know. I don't know that, but I have heard and talked to the crews uh, that once they administer the Narcan, the person comes to, they're fully conscious and alert to norm. So they were transported at that time, even mm -hmm. though they were on the verge of cardiac arrest. And then they leave wow. them and two hours later, they're right back and they're back in the same state they were in. You know, this is a devastating problem. And, and you know, I'm hearing from you in, in emergency services. I'm hearing from our chief medical examiner. 
And you know, the ironic thing to me is what I've heard from a lot of people is that drugs and drug abuse, eh, it's a victimless, haven't you heard that the victimless crime trope? It's not a victimless crime. It's a, it's a dangerous situation. When I was on the school board for 10 years, that was the number one reason we were kicking kids out of school was drugs. And toward the end of my tenure on that board, sadly, they started to water down the discipline. We used to kick them out. We used to expel them with services, continuing services. It's a, it's a nuanced distinction, but it seems like society is doing the same thing. They want to water down the consequences and the penalties because they say it's a victimless crime. 338 times you had to save someone's life with Narcan. Look at the deaths. And, you know, um, Doc, I read when I, when I was reading what you wrote, here's what you wrote to me. And, and this, is, this, is, this was the compelling part of your email. And I'll quote you. Unfortunately, COVID restrictions ease up. The drug-related fatalities are continuing to increase. You would be surprised at some of the occupations of our drug overdoses. Teachers, lawyers, nurses, firefighters, truck drivers, veterans. These are our neighbors. This is our community. I mean, what were you, when you see these things, Dr. Oleski, I mean, it must be a heartbreaking thing. I don't know how you compartmentalize it. Um, it no, it, it's, it's hard. It is hard. It's, I think the, the saddest part of my job is that I don't get to meet some of these people in real life because they seem mm. they, they could have been really interesting. Um, fentanyl, in particular, is a drug that can evade typical drug tests. So when you go in for a drug screen at your mm -hmm. work, they don't typically include fentanyl because it's actually kind of a hard test to 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 include. Um, for some reason, I, it's not in our hospital um, fat, uh, drug screen, rapid urine drug screen. So we frequently will have people who pop negative because fentanyl is a very specific opioid, um, which also in turn makes it very easy to abuse because mm -hmm. you aren't going to get picked up. They're not going to find it like they find marijuana. Um, so you can kind of quote get away with it under the radar um, mm. by being a, a secret closet fentanyl abuser. As scary as it is, um, it's 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 utterly tragic. But no, all those professions that was one week. One week. One yeah, week. That's that's, that's amazing. Are functioning people in society. Yeah. I mean, well, what, what can we do? I mean, what kind of messaging could we provide? I mean, so if you're saying, I'm so sorry, Commissioner. <laughs> no, no, please. No, please. I'm really disturbed by this because like yeah. um, you kind of, there are things that you can, like you say, you do the pop randoms and, you know, you do, you do some drug testing, but what are some of the signs that folks can be looking for in their peers or their, you know, their other, the folks that they work with, um, you know, I, there, are there any telltale signs? Um, for me, the most obvious, obviously, is if they're intravenous drug abusers, but fentanyl and methamphetamine, people usually snort or smoke it. So mm. for me, normal, the first thing I do is I look at people's wrists or their arms, but we don't have necessarily a lot. We, we do have a lot of intravenous drug abusers, but that's the easiest way to get away with it is to not inject, but to snort right. or to smoke it. Um, I would say if people are being evasive, if their eyes look glassy, um, if, if they don't want to talk about their problem, most commonly the stems from opioid addiction is from chronic pain. Um, and we created a monster in the early 2000s and mid 2000s with oxycodone. Mm -hmm. And these people are still residually addicted, even though they're not getting prescribed oxycodone anymore. We've created mm -hmm. a monster by tr over treating their pain. Mm -hmm. um, so so those are, I, I would watch out for people who've got a history of chronic pain. Um, I'd watch out for our veterans and I would just ask questions and, and see what's going on if they seem to be a little bit off. Um, support and having access to resources is the way to go. Um, and I don't know what those resources are, but that's why I'm here to <laughs> kind of hear well, about them. Well, Doc, I, I mean, like, like Janice just said, I mean, I'd, I'd like to know what we can do. Uh, and I'd like to work with our counterparts at the school board, because I think, you know, you have to, you have to start it there. You have to start with kids. And, and you know, and, and when I grew up, it was just say no to drugs. You know, the guy with the egg and the frying pan, this year, brain on drugs. Remember? And I just don't know that that was effective. A lot of people think war on drugs was ineffective. Uh, you know, maybe they're right. I don't know. But I think if someone re if someone is told, look, you could do this one time and you could be dead because you don't know what's in there. It could be fentanyl from Mexico. That's not, I mean, it's what you had said uh, to us is it's not typically 
the, the clinical pharmaceutical fentanyl, it's the street stuff, right? That's what you're seeing? Yes. Um, so thanks to having access to the Florida Prescription Medical Database, I can very quickly look up to see whether or not somebody has a prescription or they've had, had prescriptions. Mm. I have never seen a fentanyl overdose being prescribed fentanyl. So sure. all of it is illicit. Well, let me ask you, fentanyl, isn't that a kind of a heavy duty sedative, like a tranquilizer? Isn't that what it is? It is incredibly a heavy duty tranquilizer. It's also incredibly addictive. And it's got, okay. I think it's 200 times more potent than morphine, which is right. how we usually do it. So you only need a little bit. So when would a person ever get that outside of a hospital? You, you wouldn't, would you? Unless you like were Michael Jackson with your private doctor who gave it to you, or was that propofol? You that know, was both. <laughs> both. But I mean, so the average guy going into the doc with a sore back, he ain't going to get a prescription for fentanyl. You got to be in the hospital, right? To get that? Yeah. Fentanyl is, is used for those with um, or that have terminal cancer or cancer-related pain. Um, mm. They'll come in patches usually or lollipops or things like that because it's a very short-acting drug, but it's not a good long-term effective method of pain control because it mm. goes away pretty quickly. Um, but no, I, you typically would not. I have never seen a doctor write a prescription out of the ER for a prescription for fentanyl. No. Wow. Wow. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. It's, it's frustrating because I hate to hear about, you know, two weeks ago um, in the Pensacola News Journal, there was a guest editorial uh, by, a, by a woman who lost both of her sons to drug overdose, to heroin. And it, it was heartbreaking to me to read that. And um, the fact, you know, I just don't know how you carry on with something like that. But she talked about their behaviors and, and you know, they're taking phone calls in the middle of the night, running out and all these things. And, and I just got a chill up my spine when you just mentioned some of these behaviors, the glassy eyes. It's a, it's a, it's a tough issue, but, and I want to help. And I just don't know from the county's perspective, from a public policy perspective, what we can do. I mean, we could certainly do, um, use our PIO to, to put out um, ads on our website, but I think unless it's a, it's a holistic solution with the school board, with the city of Pensacola, all of us, I mean, I just don't know what we can do. Um, frustrating to me. I don't like problems that we can't resolve. Do you have any suggestions, Doc, of what we could do? What worked over in St. John's County? What, I mean. In St. John's County, there is a lot of community involvement, you know, from different groups and support groups of whether or not they can actually go in and, and talk to people. That's the, one of the bigger issues with COVID is we've got Zoom drug court we've got zoom counseling yeah. and and not having the, the actual interaction with people uh then then not having the interaction with people also makes you lose accountability to yes. sobriety yep. so i'm hoping that with things opening up that we're going to see a little bit less but so far not so good um mm. and so i'm hoping like i said as, as things are opening up people can actually interface with each other again and hold each other accountable, then I think that we're gonna to move towards a more sober society. Um, and, and Dr. Yep. Lesky, you know, you, you provided to us the domes board that oversees uh, your operations. You provided to us some numbers the other day, just in general, as to how many more um, autopsies and um, evaluations and investigations that you had to do this year over last year, and they weren't all COVID related. Um, so you want to, you want to share those numbers? I didn't know if you had them with you, but it was pretty staggering. Even though this one is the most staggering there, it was just pretty staggering in general, the number, the increase in, in the need for you and your services over this past year. Um, so we saw a 30% increase overall in non COVID fatalities. If you include okay. the COVID fatalities, it was a 70% increase in our caseload. Um, <laughs> which is, is truly remarkable. Uh, most other jurisdictions across the country aren't seeing nearly that high, although I did just see Pima County uh, in Arizona post that they had a 28% increase. Um, for the most part, I'm seeing between 15 and 20, but um, Escambia County, when I, in, in District 1, when I was looking through to figure out what is, what are, the, what's the part that we're, that's increasing the most? Um, is it, you know, traffic fatalities, is it suicides? It's not suicides. Um, traffic fatalities have definitely gone up, but I'm going to tell you it's drug overdoses, number one. And number two, um, more, I saw this more so during the actual pandemic now than I'm seeing currently, is young people who don't go to the hospital or will not go to the hospital despite having very obvious signs of 
probably a serious medical issue. Uh, like we were talking with Eric about how um, people are abusing 911, but they weren't calling 911 at all. Um, oh. They're crushing chest pain for several days and they're 35, 36. Yeah, they're not the healthiest, but I mean, that's still a preventable death. Um, oh. People who are sedentary, they're not moving around, having blood clots in their lungs. It's, it's in, and, they, and they're experiencing shortness of breath and they're so scared that maybe this is COVID and they don't want to go get tested, but it's not COVID. It's a blood clot in their lungs. Oh um, mm. That so could be preventable. Yeah, all, all of my, uh, so many of my deaths are preventable. <laughs> I want to say 95% of my deaths are preventable. Um, my that's, death, incre- that's an incredible statistic. That is an amazing, incredible statistic that I just heard. Wow. 95%? So, oh, honestly, probably somewhere like that. I mean, wow. if you think about it, like all, all traffic fatalities are preventable. All drug overdoses are preventable. All young people suddenly dying are preventable. All suicides are preventable. All co-sleeping infant deaths are preventable. These are all preventable deaths. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did want to touch on one thing, if that's okay with y'all. Yes, about ma'am. FEMA. Yes. So we're yes, talking about ma'am. federal money. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that FEMA is doing, because uh, we had talked about this last time when I was with you, uh, Commissioner Bergash, about um, unclaimed persons. So yes. FEMA is now offering uh, a substantial uh, amount of money for funeral assistance um, through the government, not through us, uh, for COVID-related deaths. I think they get up to eight or nine thousand dollars in funeral costs that are reimbursed, um, and then that can be um, requested through FEMA. You can just Google FEMA funeral assistance. Um, that number is eight hundred four six two seven five eight five. Um, to get going with that. They need to have COVID-19 somewhere in their death certificate. Um, it is our standard practice that we're not necessarily going to change um, death certificates. I can't change um, a family physician's death certificate. Um, but if it is on there and you would like to go forward with that, then that's the way that you can do it with from the federal government. And yeah, uh, unfortunately, the counties cannot submit for reimbursement. It has yeah. to be individual. Well, I'm, I'm, ha- I'm happy the money's out there. But again, you know, where's all this money coming from? It, you know, I step back from my local role as a local policymaker, and I look at the amount of debt that the government has just created. And there will come a, de- a reckoning, no matter what anyone says, no matter what their title is. When you hear the Federal Reserve chairman say, I see inflation, we perhaps need to notch up the interest rates. And then four days later, for political reasons, she walks it back and says, well, you know, maybe we don't need... We've got a problem, and all I think all of this, a lot of this outside of COVID trickles down from that irresponsible financial policy from both parties, both parties in Washington, D.C., but I'll get off the soapbox now because we're trying to talk about health stuff. Hey, let's, yeah. speaking, about, speaking of free money, um, uh, Janice, we got the American Rescue Plan. Allegedly, we're supposed to get $61.3 million or something like that or about. Dr. Oleski and I have spoken about her facility. I've been over there to see it. Um, Dr. Oleski, how did you come out of session? Did you did you get any money out of session, or are we still waiting to see if the if the governor's not going to veto it? Um, do you have news on that? Janice is shaking her head. <laughs> yeah, he has not received the budget yet, so we would have to receive the budget. Um, you know, is there he, money in there for her facility? For her facility? Uh, well, there's for planning and design, two hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, planning and design. And um, any of us that have visited her facility know the dire situation that, and I hate to say that word, but dire situation that she's in, not only from a spacing uh, for her staff and and, um, uh, her other medic, uh, her other uh, doctors, but also from just a morgue standpoint, um, there are major issues. And uh, I know that at one point we did have funeral homes and other folks very frustrated uh, with the with the lack of availability at our um, at her office to be yep. able to provide the 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 um, services that she provides, and so that then trickles down to the families and just you know yeah. closure um, in unfortunately these situations. Yeah. Well, when I oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Doc. doc go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, we're working. We're trying to work with the funeral homes because absolutely they're the key to closure. Um, we're, we're over capacity right now. We were, um, we bought a, a, a trailer, which we're still waiting on tags to be able to use to cool, um, bodies, which is sad that we're at that point that we need that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but, 
uh, you know, one of the bigger complaints I'm getting from funeral home directors is that we, there's no way for them to get in and out to pick up bodies and bring them on time. And that, you know, we are closing at a certain time or um, of day because we don't have the staff to do it. Um, and that, it breaks my heart and I never want to interfere. So we're, we're working hard with the funeral homes to make sure that they can, that, you know, somebody can stay a little bit later so that um, unfortunately they can end up in some overtime, but we got to do what we got to do to help oh, absolutely. these families. Well, I think the, the issue that a lot of folks don't understand, you're dealing with a lot more deaths this year because of COVID and then non-COVID deaths are going up. You were already in a very size challenged, constrained facility. The day I was there, I mean, your, your, your cooler was full. I remember opening, when we opened the door, I couldn't believe the number of bodies, the way you had them arranged on racks. And I mean, it was overwhelming to me. So I cannot imagine the shape that you're in now, but tell the folks what you told me on that visit about your size of your facility and the, and the population you serve compared to other cities that people will know. Sure. Um, so currently we have about 4,400 square feet. Um, in my office, I could practically touch both walls. <laughs> I, saw, I don't have yeah. a, I don't, I don't have a glorious or, or, or beautiful office, despite my my cousin's beautiful painting up there. Um, like but we, we don't. We, I think we only have seven total offices here. Um, we have no space for another doctor. We have no space for another um, any other uh, full time equivalents or um, assistant staff. But we have forty four hundred square feet total. Um, yeah. for our office and for our morgue and our cooler. So if we compare ourselves com to Denver, um, which has Denver. nearly the same population that we serve and nearly the same caseload, they have a new facility that they just moved into and have outgrown, uh, and it is 26,000 square feet. Whoa, whoa, 26,000. So we serve the same size area population as Denver, Colorado, which everyone knows, and they have a facility that's 26,000 square feet and yours is 4,400. Yes. See, that's, that's a story that needs to be told over and over in the media. And hopefully the media will tell that story. I know from our perspective, Doc, we, we want to help you. And I think we're going to work with you. I understand. Tell us a little bit about, and, and I just can't believe how fast an hour goes, but tell us quickly a little bit about your plan for your new location and how that's progressing and how much it'll cost. What's the price tag? Well, well, thank you, you know, Commissioner Burgos, for allowing me to be on here. I appreciate mm -hmm. that I get a little bit of a voice, even though in the morning, um, I'm not a morning person. I'll do. I'll, I'll be. Happy to talk to <laughs> I'm people. not either. <laughs> oh sure. <laughs> um, uh, it's, in the afternoon, if you think he's high energy now. <laughs> oh really? Ooh. After two cups of coffee. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> so we're looking. Uh, the we're looking at a sizable facility that can can serve all of our counties because I don't I'm not employed by Escambia County I'm employed by domes which is all four counties um, we're looking for something that's a little bit more central uh, in terms of being able to serve us Walton County which is an hour and a half no more than an hour and a half away from where mm -hmm. we are currently so the place that we're looking at is um, Santa Rosa's industrial complex off of I-10 and 87 um, which gives Escambia County I think a, a 12 minute extra commute and it shaves off a half an hour for everybody else, yep. which would be great. It has, five, we're looking to get four to five acres of land so that we can expand for later, um, build an adequate facility for now. And the easiest thing to expand later, of course, is office space. Um, uh, you wanna do the morgue right, which is a very specific need that needs to be done um, right the first time with adequate space to plan out for. Office space can always be added later. Um, and the total cost of that facility can be anywhere, and, and I hate, and I don't even know because it's COVID, right? I mean, you can't right. get your fence done. You can't <laughs> get anything done. You can't get you can't your get, dishwasher you repaired. Can't, you can't buy wood. Wood. I can't buy wood. I can't buy a generator. <laughs> we can't buy gas. Right. <laughs> um, What's going so on? <laughs> Pre-COVID prices uh, between fourteen and sixteen million dollars, and that would be like I said, we're going for a thirty-year facility. And the trickier part for us is that we are essential employees um, and that we are gonna need to hunker down in this facility um, and it needs to be hurricane resistant. You know, and the, the wind mitigation rules just went up too recently, yeah. so. Well, it's gonna be challenging. Dr. Oleski, I, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule. I mean, we heard from you just how busy you are now with all these extra deaths. Um, we appreciate what you do. It is a public service. It's, I mean, it has to be done and, and the families appreciate it. I appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to ask you to come back um, when we get that full report, because I want to talk about that again. And I'm going to talk about that at our next meeting 
I'm going to, I'm going to make a big point of that during our commissioner's forum, because I just think that story needs to be told people, parents, schools, pastors, people have to tell uh, these folks that, you know, this is not a victimless crime. Um, you know, there's a lot of violence and now there's a lot of death and now there's a lot of uh, stuff mixed in with these drugs that are you know, a lot of hurt, a lot of hurt. God, it's just, it's just a lot of hurt. And it seems like as a society, we want to minimize it and just, I, I want to maximize it. I want people to know. Um, and it's sad to hear about teachers, firefighters, and others dying of, of these overdoses. It's horrible. So I'd like to have you on. Uh, when do you anticipate that report will be completed? We will have our data into the Medical Examiner's Commission well before the end of June 30th. Um, okay. I think that we all just finished up our, our, our what we call pending cases. Um, I think last week so that we should have everything um, polished and ready to go. So I anticipate that we will have a full report within the next couple of weeks. And I will, of course, send that out. Okay. I'd love to have you back in July or August and we could recap and we could talk about your progress because I, I, I think this was fascinating. I, I love hearing uh, the stories. Um, I could see the passion in your face. I mean, and I, I mean, it's just, you, you've got a very difficult job. I, I don't know how you um, I just want to say next month, because of all this, uh, all the Russian hacking that we're hearing about next month, I'm going to bring a cybersecurity person onto my coffee. I'm going to um, have our director of IT. I'm going to invite Bart Siders aboard because I think that would be a very interesting discussion to have and how we as a county are trying to harden our defenses against it. You know, our, our, our counterparts over at the city were hit by a ransomware attack, um, you know, right as the COVID was taking off and it was, it was devastating to them. So we see what's going on with the Colonial Pipeline. Now we hear about other uh, uh, municipalities being hacked. So we're going to talk about that next month. That's going to be a great one. And before we go, I would be remiss if I did not thank Janice Gilly, Eric Gilmore, and Dr. Deanna Aleski for being with me this morning. Before we do go, I just want to give uh, a shout out to Tim Day and the Environmental Department because uh, we did receive from the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, concurrence with our plan. Um, and the week before that, we received our construction permit for the from the Department of Environmental Protection. So beach access number four at Perdido Key is gonna happen. Uh, Perdido Key uh, right now has issues with parking with some, some various closures of certain areas and sites. So this will be a great uh, accommodation for the residents and citizens. It'll make our fourth uh, free beach access at Perdido Key. So that's coming. So shout out to Tim Day, uh, Chips Kirschenfeld, the environmental staff facilities. Um, the Perdido Bay issue, uh, we, I was in a homeowners meeting last night at the Elks Lodge for uh, South Bay homeowners. Uh, they're looking at a potential grocery store type development near their subdivision. We spent two hours listening to their concerns. One of the issues they talked about was the traffic from Perdido Bay ER, West Florida ER, and the number of times they have to close the roads. The good news to report to citizens is, I reported this last night to these homeowners, uh, West Florida Hospital, I spoke with Gaynor, the president, and they're working on a plan to build a $1 million helipad on their property. And the county is going to do our best to expedite their permitting so that we can eliminate the shutting down of Highway 98 Blue Angel, which is a big deal for the west side of my district. Um, and, uh, concurrency, concurrency. Just want to point one thing out. We're going to have a discussion about concurrency in the county. The county's growing. These folks last night were the epitome of frustration. Um, you know, I've seen it in Beulah. We've had growth that's runaway. It's out of control. Scammy County does not have impact fees. We used to have concurrency. It was taken out of the land development code in 2013. I always supported it as a school board member because if you want to come in and build a shopping center or a giant subdivision, you ought to pay for the roads, you ought to pay for the sidewalks, and you ought to pay some money to the school board to offset the impact. So we're going to be talking about that at an upcoming meeting, and um, I look forward to having that discussion. I don't know if I'll have support but I think um, looking at Escambia County, and I want to shout out to Amber McClure for who provided this information. There are 67 counties in Florida. 66 of the 67 levy some sort of an optional sales tax like we do, our local option sales tax penny. So 99% of the counties are levying that already. But in addition, 57% are also doing some form of impact fees on development. 57%, nearly six out of 10. Escambia County is not one of them. And so I understand folks say, well, you know, we do the one penny sales tax. That's fine. Yeah. So do all the other counties. And six out of 10 of them are doing concurrency or impact fees on top because otherwise you can't pay for the roads. You can't pay. Our penny sales tax gets stretched a lot of different directions. Fire trucks, sheriff's vehicles, uh, equipment, facilities, parks. Um, so we need to have that discussion. And if there's no appetite for it, we won't do it. But we need to have that discussion because the only other counties who aren't doing this are the smallest counties that are rural and are not growing. 
Escambia County is growing because people want to live here. So I, I, I apologize. I segued a little bit on you, but we're going to have that discussion coming soon. Next, next month, we're going to talk about uh, cyber attacks. And then a couple months after, we're going to have Dr. Oleski back and we'll have an update. And um, I just appreciate everyone tuning in this morning. And Janice, Eric, and Dr. Oleski, thank you for being here. And I hope you all, we drive safely out there in the, in the storms. We'll see you guys next month.